You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. Welcome to the Useless Information Podcast. I am Steve Silverman. Frank Gridges was one of those people that never seemed to find success. Poverty just seemed to follow him throughout his entire life. Now, he was born in Sudua, Lithuania, most likely in 1868, but being a typical teenage male, he decided there was no way he's going to spend the rest of his life working on the family farm. So instead, at the age of 20, he hopped a tramp steamer to seek greater opportunity and fortunes in the United States. Sadly, that was never to happen. He arrived in Baltimore, Maryland and drifted from job to job, earning very little, and each job was harder than anything would have experienced if he had stayed back in Lithuania harvesting that wheat. He worked on an oyster boat in the Chesapeake Bay, he built fences around wealthy estates, and he even put his time in at the steel mills in Pennsylvania. Supposedly, one night in Pittsburgh he discovered a woman's pocketbook lying on the dance floor. Inside he found $60.00. And that may not seem like a lot today, but that'd be about $750 today adjusted for inflation. That much money would have made a huge difference in his life, but he knew that he couldn't keep it. Quote, I later found the lady crying that she had lost her money. I tell her I found money. How much did she lose? When she said $60, I gave her the pocketbook. Ultimately, Frank found his way to New York. Quote, when a man gets broke in other places, it is bad. Here there is work for a man that looks for it. Now, there may have been work in New York, but it paid incredibly little. In 1937, he was working for the Bimberg Passport Photo Company, which was located on the fifth floor of a building at 62 Broad Street. Frank's job was very simple. All he had to do was walk back and forth on the street carrying a sandwich board sign over his shoulders. It read, Passport Photos, 3 for 35 cents, room 500 elevator service. And then day after day, week after week, month after month, you know, through whatever nasty weather Mother Nature would throw at him, he would walk up and down the street carrying that sign. His pay was a measly $1 per day for a total of $5 per week. Now that would be about $85 per week today. This was never enough to cover his expenses, and Frank always struggled to make ends meet. Then, on Tuesday, February 5th of 1935, as he was passing in front of the stock exchange on Wall Street, his foot knocked into something that was partially covered up by the newly fallen snow. So he bent down to pick it up to see if it was money, but instead it was a stack of papers. Being uneducated, he didn't know what he had stumbled across, but he was fairly certain that it was something of importance. Frank's original plan was to hold on to the papers until 4 p.m. when his shift ended and then go to a guard that he knew at the stock exchange for assistance, you know, in returning the papers to its rightful owner. But when the guys running the newsstand took a look at what he had found, they convinced him to take immediate action. He approached police officer John J. Grace for help, quote, Johnny looked at it and said for me to come to the police station, but I can't go for fear to lose my job. Johnny took it away and brought me the receipt. And that's the end of the quote. What no one knew at the time was that there was a frantic search on to find these papers. They had been lost by 22-year-old Edward Stagmeyer, who was a messenger delivering the documents for the Belden and Company stock brokerage. Frank had found the runner's wallet, which contained 18 stock certificates. That included 500 shares of Phillips Petroleum, 600 shares of General Electric, and 260 of DuPont. Their value? $42,000. That would be over $715,000 today. Jackpot! But Frank was to get none of it, so he went right back to work. You know, he needed the money. Within hours, word of Frank's honesty had spread through the news wires. He was suddenly famous, you know, an instant celebrity. So how much did Belden & Company, which was located at 1 Wall Street, offer as a reward for Frank's honesty? Nothing. Zilch. Nada. They argued that the certificates were worthless because they were unsigned. 
but the police were quick to point out that anyone could have forged a signature on the certificates and cashed them in. So Belden insisted that if any reward was to be given, that was the responsibility of the National Surety Company, you know, the company that bonded the brokerage against such a loss. National Surety, seeking an opportunity for some good publicity, gave Frank a $75 reward, plus a guarantee of $20 per week for the remainder of the winner. That may not sound like much, but adjusted for inflation, that would be about $1,300, plus another $340 per week for what would probably be another 8 to 10 weeks of winter. Others also contributed, providing Frank with an additional $105. This included a group of newsreel men who had pooled their resources to provide Frank with an additional $5 plus a new suit, hat, and shoes. All of the negative press that Belden had received for their stinginess finally forced them to reward Frank for his honesty. They invited him up to their offices for lunch and then offered to put him to work for $70 per month for 90 days. If everything went well at the end of that three-month trial period, the job would be made permanent. They then took him out to get a haircut and a shave, then was off to a haberdashery to get a new set of clothes, which included a tie with red dots that was personally chosen for him by a female reporter. When asked what he's going to do with his newfound fame and fortune, Frank replied, quote, I'm not going to put any money in the market. He continued, and if I'm sent out with any securities, you bet I won't lose them. Frank's old employer at the Passport Photo Service, Abraham Bimberg, assured him that if this new job didn't work out, he would be welcome to return to his old job. This is a great rags, you know, kind of riches story so far, you know, don't you agree? Well, that's what I thought when I came across it, but there was just one article I didn't have when I completed writing this podcast a couple of weeks ago. That appeared in the March 6, 1937 issue of The New Yorker and was titled, Where Are They Now? Knowing that my friend Bill subscribed to The New Yorker, I asked if he'd get me a copy of the story just so I could add that one last sentence that told of what happened to Frank after all of the publicity died down. So Bill generously sent me a PDF of the article and I was shocked by what I read. Just about Everything I've told you about Frank's honesty was totally made up by the press. So here's what the article claims really happened. First of all, forget snowflakes and piles of snow on the ground. Instead, it was a clear snowless day in New York City when Frank Gridges found the wallet containing the stocks. And what did he do with the securities that he found? He pocketed them. Yep, he had every intention of keeping them. But Frank's act didn't go unnoticed. A New York Stock Exchange guard named Joseph Racker saw him put the wallet in his coat and then reported it to his superior, William Roars, who in turn told patrolman Grace what had happened. Grace then asked Frank if he had found anything, at which point the old man reluctantly handed over the wallet containing the securities. The next day, a reporter saw the police report describing Frank's valuable fine and for some reason thought it'd make a great story. As you can guess, the reporter twisted the story all around to make Frank look like a hero who is deserving of a big reward. And within a short time, Frank was a national celebrity. Both Belden and Company and the National Surety Company were placed under great pressure by the public to provide Frank with a reward for his honest actions. But behind the scenes, they grumbled at the idea of doing so. After all, why should they reward a guy who had no intention of ever returning the stock certificates to them? They were cornered with the threat of bad publicity, and they really had no choice but to give Frank the rewards and the job that I had previously described. And now for the rest of the story, of which everyone seems to be in general agreement. Everything seemed to be looking up for Frank Ridges. You know, he had money, a decent job, and a new set of clothes but for some reason he became unhinged on February 22nd. First, he was observed to walk up to the door of his flophouse room, knock, and then invite himself in. 
That's not really a big deal, but later in the evening, he pushed a 67-year-old man named Frank Kelly down the stairs, fracturing his skull. Then, around 2 a.m., he was walking aimlessly around the lobby of the Flophouse. Quote, Everywhere I go, people stare at me. I am the man who found the money. They stare at me. I kill them. I had a bad day today. I kill only three. Most days I kill 15. I am God. Suddenly, he turned to his 35-year-old Michael Griswack and blurted out, I am God and I'm going to kill you. I can kill anyone who looks at me. Or maybe it was, I can look at a man and kill him with a look. Or maybe it was, I am God, look at me, and you die. You get the idea. As the earlier part of the story confirmed, newspapers of the day were not known for their accuracy. But the next detail they all agree upon. Gretas gave Griswack the death stare, you know, the old evil eye, and suddenly Griswack just dropped dead on the floor. Really, I'm not making this up. It took five officers to subdue Frank enough to get him into a straitjacket. They first took him to the Elizabeth Street Police Station before calling in an ambulance to transport him to Bellevue for a psychiatric evaluation. An initial diagnosis suggested that Frank may have had a cerebral hemorrhage which produced this bizarre behavior. But he did recover and was released from the hospital on March 23rd. He took a taxi to a friend's home, which was located at 11 State Street, and the doctors recommended that he avoid stress and just kind of, you know, take it easy for a while. As for the death stare, that was pure coincidence. It turns out Griswack had been severely ill with tuberculosis, and he was already a skeleton of a man who was close to death. Ultimately, Frank was never able to hold a steady job again. Belden and company let him go in early May. He secured a job that the press just loved, that of a sandwich man making real sandwiches at a restaurant. But he quickly quit that job because right after the reporters left, he was demoted to peeling potatoes in the kitchen. He then hopped from job to job before finally going out on relief, which paid him $12.40 bi-weekly, and that was more than he was earning carrying signs. What is clear from the New Yorker article is that he was clearly losing his memory, a victim of old age. Useless, useful, I'll leave that for you to decide. All hands on deck, here's Popeye! Like all the boys want to be football players, and they're eating Popeye's favorite cereal because it makes muscle. And it looks like the girls all want to grow up in a hurry and be young ladies, so they eat Wheatina too, because Wheatina's regular growing food. And my, the roses it puts into their cheeks. Yes, sir. And mmm, boy, how good it tastes. Well, any other boys and girls want muscle or want to go fast? Okay, tell mother you want that delicious Wheatina tomorrow. That commercial for Wheatina is from a 1936 episode of Popeye the Sailor radio show. This particular episode was titled Popeye and the Gang at the Zoo. The show started on the NBC Red Network before moving to CBS. Now, Wheatina may seem like an odd sponsor for Popeye, well, let's face it, what are the chances of them getting the growers of spinach to do so? Wheatina was first created by George Hoyt in New York City in 1879. 
Now, it wasn't the first toasted whole wheat cereal, but what made it unusual for its time was that it came pre-packaged in boxes. You see, back then, cereals were sold in bulk by your grocer. He then sold the business six years later to a company simply titled The Health Food Company. By the 1920s, they were selling millions of boxes of Wheatina each year. Today, the product is manufactured by the Homestead Farm Company in High Spire, Pennsylvania. They also manufacture another retro brand, that's Mapo Oatmeal Cereal. Now, Wheatina is one of those products I've seen on the grocery shelves on and off over the years, but I have to admit I've never tried it. I guess I've just never been a fan of warm cereals. But then again, there's a lot of things I didn't like when I was a kid and I now do eat. So maybe I should give it a try this coming winter. In other news, chess is typically thought as being a fairly slow game where each opponent carefully considers all the possible options and of course the consequences before making a move. But few, if any, games of chess took as long as the one between Hugh P. Harrison and his aunt Annie Patton, who lived 20 miles or 32 kilometers apart from each other in England. That game was played by sending their moves back and forth through the mail for 20 years. It ended in 1940 when Mrs. Patton died. The game was left unfinished, so let's just call it a draw. Moving on. Sad news came out of Marineland, Florida on April 6th of 1957 when it's reported that an 8-year-old porpoise named Algae had accidentally swallowed a 4-inch or 10-centimeter rubber ball. It lodged in his first stomach and veterinarians did all they could to extract it. Sadly, Algae died on the operating table. It turns out his trainers had been using the ball to teach him how to play baseball which consisted of Algy taking the ball in his mouth and pitching it to the batter, who just happened to be his trainer. Algy swallowed the ball while learning how to take the ball into his mouth to pitch it back. And lastly, on August 4th of 1960, a mule in Charlotte, North Carolina, managed to wreck three cars. As the mule was walking down the highway, it was first hit by a car driven by 25-year-old Earl Leo Sellers. The mule was thrown on top of the car as it careened into a ditch. The mule then somehow was able to stand back up and head right back out onto the highway, at which point a car driven by 33-year-old Lucius Parker hit the mule before coming to a stop in a tobacco field. The mule remained lying in the road for an additional 15 minutes, at which point a third car, one driven by Benjamin Booker, hit him. The first two drivers ended up in the hospital with injuries, while the mule was not as lucky. Sadly, it lost its life after the third collision. Well, that's it for this episode of the Useless Information Podcast. This was a fun story to research, you know, even though it didn't turn out to be entirely true in the end. Additional true stories just like the one you heard can be found on my website, which is uselessinformation.org, and in the two books written by me, Steve Silverman. They are Einstein's Refrigerator and Lindbergh's Artificial Heart. You can like the show on Facebook, you know, just do a quick search for the Useless Information Podcast, and of course it'll pop up. Also be sure to subscribe to the podcast so you can receive automatic updates when a new episode is released. You can do that through iTunes or just about any other podcasting software. Lastly, if you've never done so, please be sure to write some positive comments on the show on iTunes. Uh, That'll help get more listeners to the podcast. Anyway, thanks for listening, and I hope for those in the Northern Hemisphere, have a great summer. For those in the Southern, I hope you have a great winter. And I hope you tune in the next time. Bye.